Hello, tonight we're going to read The Stuff Between the Stars. Vera always liked looking at the night sky, but when she was 11, she moved to a new house with a bedroom so small the only place to look was up through her window. As she lay in bed, a star slipped into sight, slowly snuck across the pane, and disappeared. Others followed. The stars were stirring, and something bright stirred in Vera, too. Vera started studying maps of the sky. She read about the way stars fired their own glow, the way planets reflected the star's bloom. She built a telescope out of a lens and a long cardboard tube so she could reach further into the heavens. Every night, as the sun's light emptied from the sky, Vera switched off her lamp to make her parents think she was asleep. She watched the Big Dipper circle the North Star. She memorized the trails of shooting stars so she could map their paths in the morning. And when Vera's eyelids grew heavy, she dreamed not about what she had seen, but about what she had not seen. She dreamed about the mysteries between the stars. When Vera was 17, she went to college so she could learn more about the universe. She had already learned that young women weren't welcome in the man's world of astronomy. Her high school teacher had told her to stay away from science. One college suggested that painting would be a better choice. Vera didn't want to paint. She wanted to observe. At Vassar College, she was the only astronomy major in her class. She could reach into the heavens with the school's long telescope whenever she wanted. By the time Vera finished college, she had fallen in love with Robert Rubin, a mathematician. With their marriage, her life took a new turn. Just as the moon orbits both the earth and the sun, Vera's life began to revolve around both her new family and the night sky. As a baby grew inside her, Vera began studying a question that had left a trail through her mind. Was it possible that galaxies rotated around a center in the universe like the Big Dipper circled the North Star? She plotted galaxies on a globe, carefully measured how they moved, and then measured again. Just before her son was born, Vera concluded that her de idea might just be right. Vera drove through a snowstorm thick as the Milky Way to share her research at a gathering of America's most important senior astronomers. The men were all clustered together like the bright bulge of a galaxy. They all seemed to know each other. Vera knew no one. She stood before them and told them about the movement of galaxies. One by one they stood up. They said her out ideas were outlandish. They said her conclusion was ridiculous. Vera felt like the smallest, slowest star on the edge of their galaxy. She asked herself, will I ever really be an astronomer? Vera didn't like the harsh words, pushing her away. So after she gave birth to a baby girl, she studied a new question quietly on her own. A question she thought would be a lot of fun. Were the starry galaxies scattered any which way across the universe? Or was there a pattern to where they spun? As her husband and children slept, Vera stayed up with the moon and stars. She multiplied and divided and multiplied some more. At the end of several months, Vera had her answer. Galaxies were clumped together like dewdrops on a spider's web. It was a surprising discovery. It went against what everyone thought. It was a discovery that earned her the title of Doctor of Astronomy. This time, America's most important astronomers didn't criticize Vera. They ignored her. She still felt like a faraway star on the edge of their universe. As Vera's family grew with two more sons, Vera read everything she could about galaxies. She dreamed about observing them from high atop a mountain, like the senior astronomers. She would watch as gravity, powerful at the galaxy center, spun nearby stars round and round. She would watch as gravity, 
weak at the outskirts, let st left stars to creep around their edges. Vera began teaching astronomy at colleges and government offices in Washington, D.C. Little by little, other astronomers heard about Vera and her discoveries. They wanted to talk to her about her outlandish and ridiculous ideas. They wanted to see how galaxies clustered together like dewdrops. Through it all, Vera couldn't stop thinking about the mystery she might find if she could observe from high on a mountain. The Carnegie Institution had observatories in, Calif in the California mountains. Vera decided it was time they hired their first woman. She walked inside, sat down, and announced, I really want to have a job here. Startled and not knowing what to say, the scientists invited her to lunch. As they ate, the director asked Vera to go to the blackboard and tell them about her work. He was so impressed, he gave her a job. At last, Vera would be able to see deep into the universe. She would be able to record images of what was there. As senior astronomers crowded around other questions, Vera chose to study something no one else was looking at. The remote, slow-moving stars at the edges of galaxies. At Palomar Observatory in California, Vera's first discovery was that there was no women's room. She solved the problem quickly by taping a paper skirt to the stick man on the bathroom door. And then, in Arizona, at the top of Kitt Peak, Vera got her first glimpse of the Andromeda Galaxy's outside spiral. Under the cool night sky, she watched the stars stir as a camera recorded the galaxy's spin. When Vera developed the first images, she couldn't quite believe what she saw. The stars on the galaxy's edge weren't moving slowly like everyone thought they should. Even though they were very far away from the galaxy's central pull of gravity, they were moving just as fast as the stars at the center. When more and more images showed the same thing, an idea started turning in Vera's mind. Earlier astronomers had said that something mysterious might be at work in the universe, something that had its own gravity. Some called it missing mass because they couldn't locate it. Some called it dark matter because it didn't burn bright like stars or reflect like planets. Dark matter, thought Vera. This mysterious stuff could fill the space between the stars. And then, like glitter caught in an invisible halo, all the stars would turn at the same pace. Dark matter might not burn bright like the stars, but Vera could tell it was there by how it made the stars move. When Vera told the senior astronomers what she had seen, some believed her. Most didn't want to. There was far more dark matter in the night sky than light. If Vera was right, it would mean they had been studying only a fraction of the universe. Vera went back to the top of the mountains and took more images of galaxies in motion. The youngest wheeled like pinwheels, with their arms open wide. The oldest spun with their arms closed tight. Vera examined forty, sixty, two hundred. In every single one, the stars on the edges moved just as fast as those in the center. The senior astronomers stopped shaking their heads. They finally admitted Vera was right. She had shown that the mysterious dark matter made up more than 80% of the matter in the universe. Vera was no longer at the edge of astronomy. She was at its very center. Scientists crowded around the question, what is dark matter? Vera joked that it could be cold planets, dead stars, bricks, or baseball bats. She wasn't bothered by not knowing. For her, the fun of astronomy was searching for new mysteries where no one else was looking. That and watching the stars from the top of a mountain, or from her bedroom window. Each one of you can change the world, for you are made of star stuff, and you are connected to the universe. The end. I hope y'all enjoyed. A special shout out to Charles and William. I love y'all. Good night.